search the world But he couldn't feel me And there's empty praise And treasures of faith I never enough And you came along And put me back together
Psalm 95. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing songs of praise to him. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. The sea belongs to him, for he made it. His hands from the dry land too. So come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. If only you would listen to his voice today. Folks, we want to encourage you this morning, today, to enter into worship here at Central Community Church. Come down here with us each Sunday at 9.45 a.m. and worship with us. If you can't make it, we'll still continue doing this online, but we really encourage you to come down now. Come down and worship with us. Worship with us. Come down and worship with us. When you do this, it'll help you get your mind off the issues of the day that you're facing. And onto our God who is bigger than any problem or circumstance in your life. And the only, the only way that each one of us can be ministered to today is through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's only through him that each one of us can be ministered to on a personal level. So as we open this morning, folks, in prayer, I would ask that you reach out to God right now. And just open your heart to what he would like to do in your life this morning. Let's pray. Lord of all, you came to bring us grace. You lived and breathed as one of us. And Lord, you know how we can be filled with laughter and the sounds of joy and pure enjoyment. And in a world filled with every reason for sadness and depression, Lord, just remind us how to laugh and to see the hope that we have in you. And as people of redemption, Lord, we need the catharsis of, of laughter and the relief of humor. Open our mouths for more than questions or condemnation, but let our laughter rise to the heavens. Purify our being through the release of tension and congeniality. And just let us praise you. Let us be joyful. Let us laugh in love and gratitude as we forever worship you in spirit and in truth through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
when face to face we see the one who died to set us free the one who rose in victory yes you did you conquered the grave praise now Praise God from all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him. Father, Son, and Holy
Welcome to part three of our Seeking Joy series, our 12-part Seeking Joy series, folks. This one's called The Joy of Inte uh, Integrity, part three. You know, integrity is being the same. Someone once defined integrity as keeping your commitments after the circumstances under which your commitments were made have changed. You keep your commitment. That's what integrity is. Well, because of his stand for the faith, Paul was facing the possibility of his death. And you remember this book that we're studying, the book of Philippians, was written by Paul while he was under house arrest in Rome. So in writing to these Philippian believers, he shared his concern. He knew what, what had happened to him, what was coming to him, and what would soon also be coming to them. They too would face responsibility. They too would face pressure. And he wanted to be certain. He really wanted to be certain that they would be ready for it when, they, when it came. And we're so thankful today be, he had those thoughts because as he helped the Philippian believers prepare themselves for persecution or harassment or whatever else you want to call it, by helping those Philippians, he also helped us today. He's given us what we need to know to face the challenges in our lives. And men and women, these challenges for us who name the name of Christ in faith have never been greater in the years that I've been alive in this country. It's more unpopular to be a Christian today than it's ever been. And there's toleration for just about everything today. Some things you can't believe that are tolerated, but there's almost no toleration for those that believe. Isn't that amazing? So whether we face the ragged edge of persecution that Paul is talking about here, or, or just what we might call harassment, we're in the game. We're in the game, and we need to know how to win this game. So like a coach presenting his game to the players, Paul sends his friends to Philippi. And, uh, and he sends to his friends in Philippi, he sends them four priorities that would help them endure persecution, to endure harassment and the problems that they would face because of their commitment to Christ. The first priority that he mentions is conduct. So clearly in verse 27, he says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Okay, the very first line he says that. And the word for conduct, conduct in this text is really an interesting word. It's, it's politeo or polis. Okay, it's, it's a word for city. You know, and that word is used many times in our English language like this. And we have a place called Indianapolis, Minneapolis. A big area around a city is always called a metropolitan area. It's the word from which we get the word politics. So let me read that verse again. Only let your politics be worthy of the gospel of Christ. You see that? Not your conduct, your politics. How's that for an application? Also, the word police comes from this word. And we've carried this word over into our culture. You see, in the Greek language, the word meant the largest political unit. Okay? The citizens that belong to a city. And Paul was writing to the citizens of Philippi. And the Philippians would have understood this really well because of, because of their situation. You see, Philippi was a Roman colony that was surrounded by a Greek world, okay? It was 800 miles away from Rome, and it was fully Roman, but it was not in Rome. The citizens of Philippi were literally citizens of Rome, and their names were on the rolls in the city of Rome. And he, Paul says to them, just as you are a colony of Rome, 800 miles removed... You're also citizens of another place, a little further than 800 miles. You are citizens, folks, you are citizens of heaven. And, he, and here's the best part. He makes no apology for that. And on occasions in his writings, he uses the very term. In the third chapter of Philippians, he says it this way. In Philippians 3.20, he says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as Paul writes to the Philippian believers about their heavenly citizenship, he exhorts them to allow their allegiance to heaven to affect the way they live their lives here on earth. He says, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Wow. Over the years as a pastor, I've been asked so many times, is this okay? Can a Christian do this? 
What about the casinos, Pastor? Can a Christian go to the casinos? I get letters and emails and questions, so I want to answer them all today. I'm going to answer every one of them today. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Run what you want to do through that grid and quit sending me the emails. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. There's your answer. Wouldn't it be interesting if that's the way we began every day? Lord, help me to live my life today in a way that's worthy of the truth that I am a citizen of heaven. And if we were to do that, think about it, it would take a lot of complication out of how life, our lives are lived. When we live for Christ, we walk with Christ. When we process life through a mind of Christ, we are uniquely different from all the world around us. as uniquely different as were the Romans surrounded by a Greek culture. But when men and women see that, it makes an impact on them. Have you ever noticed if you work in a secular place, as most of us do, they give us, as Christians, grief all the time? They know we're Christians. And maybe you carry your Bible to work. Maybe you do. What a brave thing for you to do if you do that. Or they hear you having conversations with other Christians. You see, and they kind of look at you, and maybe they make some kind of strange remarks about you. But here's what I know, folks. Here's what I know. (laughs) This is amazing. When trouble comes, yours is the first door that they come to knock on. Why is that? Because the evidence of Christ in your life and the way you live, it's a reminder to them of something different than this world. And we may not think we need something different when things are going well. But when things start to go south on us, folks, we need an anchor. And that anchor is Jesus. I've seen this happen with our children. Many who went to secular colleges. I can't begin to tell you some of the things that have happened to our kids and others because they're Christians. But when those who have harassed them have gotten into a jam... The first person they call on at the college is the person whose conduct is becoming of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul says what you do, what you do most of all, live in a way that honors the Lord. Number two, the second priority is consistency. And I love this verse. In verse the second part of this verse, in verse 27, it says, So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit. Paul said, when I'm with you, you seem to do well. I'm not worried about that. What I'm worried about is when I'm not with you, what will you do then? And people tell tell me sometimes, hey, Malcolm, when you're gone, things are not always quite the same as when you're here. I never know what that means, and I (laughs) I choose not to ask. But isn't it interesting that when there's a leader or there's somebody who's in the middle of it, and they're present... Things are different. Have you ever noticed that? But when they're gone, things go back to being the same as they were before. Paul was saying this. He says, I want your faith to be in Christ, though, not in me. I want your faith to be in Christ, not in me. I want it to be so that when I'm with you, or whether I'm not with you at all, you stand fast for the things that you believe, that your faith is consistent not controlled by your circumstances, not not determined by your environment, but you're the same through it all. Your con- it's consistency. Oh, what a tremendous tool is in the hand of God. Consistent Christians who face the troubles and the joys and the problems and the pain, they're just Christians in the midst of it all. They still are Christians through it all. They're consistent. When trouble comes, you can't let trouble make you different than who you are. You can't let it happen. Best be sure of who you are before the trouble comes, though. You see? And trouble will not make you different. You'll be consistent through that trouble. It will bring you, it will bring you the courage that was latent in your life, latent on your, in your life all along. And here's the third one. The first priority is your conduct, as we talked about. The second is consistency. The third one is cooperation. In verse 27, he says, he says um, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. 
I have to say to you today, as a congregation, that the Christian life was never meant to be lived alone. Never meant to be lived alone. It was meant to be together in a church family. Not just here in church, but certainly to gather together in church. So we're all here together to testify to that. We're here together because the Lord Jesus gave us the church, his great gift to the body of Christ. Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. So much the more as you see the day approaching, says the book of Hebrews. But within the church, that's, there's even greater togetherness. That's why church is so important. It's time to come back to church. It is so important. It really is. It's vital. When Paul instructed these believers to strive together, he used the Greek word from which we get the word athlete. This is a special unity of striving together, struggling side by side, like athletes against a common opponent. Paul said, as Christians, we are to stand together, not alone. We're to strive forward together. That our strength as believers is not in who we are individually, but who we are collectively. You're not going to believe this, but I actually had an English major in college. We had to read a lot of things that I would not have chosen to read where I had not been an English major in college. I just wouldn't have read them. But here's something that was written by English poet and novelist Rudyard Kipling. I always remember Rudyard Kipling because when I was in Boy Scouts, he wrote the, the Jungle Story and all that. But he penned a verse that visualizes what I'm saying here. Here's what he wrote. And I'll put that above my head on the screen. Now this is the law of the jungle, as old and as true as the sky. And the wolf that shall keep it may prosper, and the wolf that shall break it must die. As the creeper that girdles the tree trunk, the law runneth forward and back. For the strength of the pack is the wolf, and the strength of the wolf is the pack. When it comes to standing for the faith of the gospel, folks, truth in times of pressure, the law of the jungle is in force. The strength of the church is in the Christian, and the strength of the Christian is the church. You see? There was a program here many years ago for prayer, and I do remember it. I think it was called Triple Chord or something like that. And it was based on a verse of scripture in the book of Ecclesiastes that you may have never seen but may but listen to perf Listen, listen to the profundity of this verse. I'm going to read it to you. Uh, Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. It's about the value of a friend. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Solomon wrote this. Solomon in his wisdom said there's strength in numbers. We don't face the harassment of the church by ourselves. We may face it by ourselves for a few hours during the week. That may happen. But the fact that there's more toleration for everything in our culture today than for Christianity is not something that we have to deal with by ourselves. We have to deal with that, folks, as a church, as a church family, as a family of God. We can't do this alone. We come together as a church and we find consolation in one another. That's what this church is about. It's always been about that for over a hundred years. We find courage in one another. And we discover in our personal conversations, we're not the only ones who are facing this. And so we are strengthened to be strong in our faith. When we're trying to prove the integrity of our lives, it takes conduct that's worthy of the gospel of Christ. It takes consistency so that whatever situation we might be in, we still remain the same. It takes cooperation. We don't do this by ourselves. We strive together for the gospel, yes? And finally, folks, it takes courage. It takes courage. You remember what we learned about Paul? Everywhere he went, he had two stops in every city, the synagogue and the prison. Everywhere he went. He visited all of them regularly. And here's what he tells us. And we may not need this for right now, 
but surely we will need it. He says in Philippians 1, 28 through 30, he says, And not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also, also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. Paul knew from experience that there would be many occasions for his brothers and sisters in Philippi to demonstrate strength beyond what they personally possessed. So he closes this section of his letter by exhorting the Christians to really face their opponents with courage. And that's tough. He provided guidelines, folks, to, to help them accurately identify those times of harassment and, and draw strength from each other and draw strength from Jesus. He begins by asking them to have courage to encounter persecution. And he says, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries. That's an interesting phrase. You know, the word terrified is only used one time in the New Testament. In the New Testament and here it is, right here, this word. And it's a word that is used of horses that are spooked into an uncontrollable stampede. Paul is saying to the believers in Philippi, don't get spooked by those who come after you. Don't get blown off course. Don't get scared. In a word, that describes an inward fear caused by an outward stimulus. You see that? It's very appropriate for this little group of believers living in Philippi. The courage in the, in the face of opposition is a double-edged sword. Paul says it's the evidence of the believer's salvation. Okay? Okay? It's, but to you, it's salvation that's from God. What does he mean by that? The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. For those who are godly in Christ Jesus, what does it say about us? When we, so when we suffer persecution, we go around complaining about it, don't we? And we're complaining about the badge of our salvation. And let me tell you something. If you're not living for Christ, then those people aren't going to bother you. They're not going to bother you. They probably think you're one of them. You see? But if you live for Christ, if you walk with the Lord, if you're different, if you're not trying to be like everybody else in the world, if, you, if what you believe is being translated into how you live and how you behave, yes, I'm telling you, someone's going to come after you. Someone's going to come after you. And when they do, the Bible says that that is an evidence of your salvation, that you have been thought worthy of harassment by those who do not know Jesus Christ. Wow! They see Jesus in you, and they're coming after you. This is your courage, ready to stand up and go. I imagine now, at home, or wherever you are, it's quiet. you've gotten quiet all of a sudden. Paul knew what he was talking about. You know, historically, this letter was written somewhere between 60 AD and 63 AD. And it was a time when the pressure of the Roman Empire was so intense. The Emperor Nero was in charge, and he was crazy. And it was in July of AD 64 that he surpassed himself in cruelty and ordered his servants to set fire to the city of Rome. And one of the few eyewitness historians of that day, a man named Tac Tacitus, he said this, Consequently, to get rid of the report that he had ordered the fire, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, people called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. So what happened after Nero in an angry moment, burned down a city, he blamed the Christians for burning down the city and began to persecute them then as enemies of Rome. Enemies of Rome. I haven't the courage to tell you some of the things he did, but here's a couple of illustrations. He would take Christians and he'd put clothing on them that was the bare skin of animals, and with the smell of the animals on it, he'd just throw them into the Colosseum where the lions would just decimate them. On one occasion, he took some of the Christians and covered them with pitch, and stationed them around the Colosseum. And then he lit them on fire as human torches. This is what was coming down the road for some of the Philippians when Paul wrote this letter. I read recently one of the greatest and most serious deficits of Christian preaching today 
is refu- we refuse to get our people ready to suffer. And when suffering comes, the people of God have no clue. They have no clue what to do. They respond to it just like everybody else in the world, but we have something different going on in our behalf. If we just use it, we have the word of God. We have God's encouragement to us that it may be suffering for now, but folks, it is glory, glory forever. And not be blown away by the difficult things that happen in life. It's easy for that to happen. Isn't it interesting as we look back over our shoulders to realize how many times as we see the whole totality of an event, we've been blown off course by things that should not have even moved us in the first place. But they did. Paul regarded, regarded suffering for Christ as a privilege. In fact, in these verses that we've been reading, he talks about it coming as a gift from God. He says that blessing, uh, ble- that blessing is in suffering for him. There's no blessing in just suffering and being in pain. That's not the issue. The issue is if we're doing it because of him, because of God. If we're doing it in his behalf. If we're doing it because we've been accused of being who we are, Christians. Men and women who are followers of Jesus. There is a blessing in that. You see? In fact, isn't that just what Jesus said in his Beatitudes? He said in Matthew 5, 10 through 12, he says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who... Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for your great for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And those of us, folks, who are real about life, know that that's a part of who we are. Whether it happens to be the level of harassment or not, we're born with trouble. From the shedding of blood that initiates birth to the last gasp of of astonishment in the face of death, we are encircled by suffering throughout our life. The biography, biography of a human being is a history of anguish. The way we react to suffering of life matters more in creative and human terms than the suffering itself. We become the people we are through the disadvantages and conflicts we prefer to more comfortable alternatives. In other words, he said that we have this potential and desire to push suffering and pain away from us as far as we can get it. Not today, Lord, not this week, and not for for whatever it's worth, not ever. I don't want it. But it's through those moments of suffering, folks, that we learn the most important lessons of life. It's when we suffer and we discover that God is enough that we have a great faith, our great faith in the Lord. If we did not have these troubles... If we did not have some suffering, how would we ever know that the Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient for every need? How would we? We know he's sufficient for the good times. But folks, I'm here to tell you he's sufficient for all times, good and bad. And no matter what we face and what we're doing through, he is enough. He is enough. And that's why Paul urges the Philippians not to be terrorized when things happen. They're about to discover that the God about whom he has taught them will be enough. Courage to encounter persecution, endure pain. Finally, to emulate Paul, Paul's saying, if you're still having trouble with this, and you still don't know how this works, and you still don't know how to make this happen in your lives, listen, just watch me. He said in Philippians 1.30, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. Where's Paul? He's in prison. There's two passages in Scripture that describe everything that Paul went through. I mean, this guy suffered every kind of pain you can imagine. He talks about how many times he was whipped, how many times he was shipwrecked. They tried to kill him by stoning him. They tried to throw him off. They did everything they could to destroy this man. And he just kept continuing to be the person that God called him to be. So he said, if you don't really get this, let me be an example for you. Just do what I've done. Stand strong. I'm not ready to say that to you all. As I said to you at the beginning, I don't know a lot about this. I know a little bit about cancer. I know a little bit about some organizational turmoil. I've had one or more than one or two crises in my life, in my extended family. But when you put me up against Paul, 
I'm not even in the same universe. So I'm glad that he's told me what to say today because I wouldn't know what to say if he hadn't told me what to say. You see? He's been there. He's done it. And I accept it as a path forward. I'm reminded that persecution is not always bad. Harassment is not always for our destruction. Sometimes the problems we face are simply God's way of burning the rubbish from our lives so that the gold will rise to the top and we become the people that he created us to be. So here's a tutorial for all of us when we're having a bad day, when things are tough. This is what we do, according to, according to Paul. The joy of integrity. Let's pray. Loving Father, Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is the perfect example of a man with a godly character and integrity of spirit. Lord, Lord, we just long to be more like Jesus in all our actions and attitudes. We pray that you would guard our hearts and strengthen our characters. Teach us your ways. Uphold us, Lord, with your righteous hand. And develop in us the grace and integrity that only comes from being in Christ. Help us just to be true to your word and righteous in all our doings. And enable us to conquer the temptations and tests and trials that will inevitably come our way. But in a manner that's pleasing to you. Lord, just help us to be diligent in our work, faithful in our witness, and helpful to those whom we come in contact, and be ready to wait on you for your right timing and for your best direction. And give us, as we pray, Lord, more of your grace so that we may speak the truth in love. Enable us to grow in sincerity and wisdom and in the light of your perfect love. Search out any dark area, Lord, in our hearts that need to be cut away or pruned back so that we may be fruitful in your service, grow in grace, and be increasingly conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ whose name we pray. Amen. Son of God is And the joy we share as we 
tarry, tarry there. None there has ever Has ever known. Before we close in prayer, folks, I want to thank you all for joining us today online. YouTube or Facebook, whichever one you're joining us on. I also want to thank you, uh, if you for those that have joined us here at the church today. And I also want to hope, and I hope that all of you that are watching will come and join us as well here at church, 9.45 a.m. each Sunday. We'd love to have you come down here and worship with us. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we pray that you draw your church together into one great company of disciples, together following our Lord Jesus Christ into every walk of life, just together serving him in his mission to the world and together witnessing to his love on every continent and island. Father, as we take our worship, praise, and prayer from this place and into our daily lives, we pray that our lives be sustained through the love of you, our Heavenly Father. And may we feel the presence of our Savior walking beside us and know the power of the Spirit of both our actions and our words. Lord, we pray now that you bless your children Give them wisdom, guidance, and protection in the week ahead so you can all join back here together again as your church family, a real church family that's together, Lord, with courage and integrity through adversity and continuity. Bless your children, Lord. Bless them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Folks, I want to thank you for joining us uh, this Sunday. It's so great to, and I want, I'm glad you're watching us online. I said before, we'd love for you to come down to church now. If you've been vaccinated, sure, come on down. It's just a great time here uh, to worship God together. We'd love for you to join us. We have Zoom 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday nights. We'd I'd love for you to come and join us on that. All the links are on the pages. I'll continue to putting them out there if you want. You're more than free to join us. Bring your family in, anybody you want. You don't even have to be a member of this church to join us on the Zoom fellowship night. Tuesday night, 6.30 p.m. Go to our Facebook page. A link will be there, put out each week, usually Mondays or Tuesdays. And uh, but if you go down and scroll down, you'll find the link. Also, uh, go on our, our website. It's there. And also on our YouTube channel. It's also there. And if not, just contact me, and uh, I'll give you the link to that as well. We'd love for you to join us. Have a blessed week, and we'll see you all here next Sunday at 9.45 a.m. I hope to see all of you here that are watching now. I love you. God bless you all, and have a beautiful and blessed week. Bye, guys. Bye-bye now.